You're just too good to be true. Can't take my eyes off you. G'day and welcome to Emergency Medicine Topics in One Coffee. I'm Alan Giles, I'm an emergency physician, and today we're going to talk about blunt and penetrating eye injuries. Firstly, a little bit of anatomy. Think about the eyes being made up of three layers. There's the connective tissue layer, the vascular layer, and the neural layer. So the outer layer is a connective tissue layer. That's the cornea, and then the sclera, and continues around to the optic nerve sheath. Deep to that is the vascular layer. It's the ciliary body and processes, the iris and the choroid plexus. And lastly, deep to that layer is the nervous layer with the retina and, of course, the optic nerve. So from the outside, going inwards, there's the avascular cornea, made up of five layers, gets its nourishment from tears, into the aqueous humor of the anterior chamber, which extends to the front of the iris. And then between the back of the iris and the lens is the posterior chamber. Here's the ciliary body, circular, made up of ciliary muscle and ciliary processes, which make aqueous humor. Here's the lens, and through that, posteriorly into the gel-like vitreous humor. Now we hit the retina, which is made up of 10 layers, the outer third supplied by the choroid, the inner two-thirds by the retinal artery, which is, of course, a terminal branch of the ophthalmic artery. There are a few aspects of the physical examination I'd just like to emphasize. Do a visual acuity early, before the swelling occurs. Now, use a Snellen's chart. Of course, using a formal Snellen chart at six meters often is impractical, but you can get a scaled down one for your smartphone. If they're unable to read the top line of the Snellen chart, see if they can perceive fingers. If they can't perceive fingers, can they perceive light? Start from the outside and go inwards. Look at the lids, then the sclera, the cornea, the pupil, its size, shape, and reaction to light. Can you see anything layered out in that anterior chamber? Is the pupil clear? And then go on to check eye movements. And finally, you'll need a good ophthalmoscope to look at the retina. Obviously, sometimes you're going to use a slit lamp to look especially at the cornea and the anterior chamber. Let's now look at some of the injuries you might see. We'll start with blunt injuries, like, like a poke in the eye. What's the matter? I've got my eyes closed. Ah! Now this may cause bleeding of the ciliary body or the iris, which puts blood in the anterior chamber. It may layer out, as we can see here, or occasionally fill the entire anterior chamber, the so-called eight ball appearance we can see. This gives you pain, decreased vision, photophobia. The pupils normally you know, looks normal and it's responsive. This is, of course, a high femur. The patient should have initially the eye padded, sit up at 45 degrees, given some analgesia, and referral mate to an ophthalmology team. If, like here, you get smacked by a ball, the orbital wall can fracture and the inferior rectus muscle can get trapped. The patient will be unable to look up on that side. Remember to check the sensation over the infraorbital nerve. These patients usually get an x-ray, but require a CT scan and ophthalmological review. They normally go oh, pretty early to theatre. Another thing that can happen when you get a blunt force to the eye is you can have spasm of the iris muscle. You can get spasm of the sphincter pupillae or spasm of the dilator pupillae. So you can get traumatic meiosis or more commonly traumatic midriasis. Going further backwards, that blunt force can dislocate the lens from its zonule, that is, its surrounding capsule. This is a fairly characteristic appearance we can see here. The lens can go forward into the anterior or posterior chamber. Occasionally, it can even go backwards into the vitreous. As you'd guess, this grossly decreases your vision and needs to go to the operating theatre. The white sclera can rupture, usually at the limbus, which is a weak area where the muscles insert. You get a distorted pupil and see the exposed choroid. Again, check the visual acuity, analgesia, shield the eye, and call ophthalmology. Now next we should mention 
retroorbital hematomas. This is where blood collects behind the eye after trauma and pushes the eye forward. We're seeing, I think, more of this because of people on NOAX and other anticoagulants. As you can imagine, this is very painful. There's proptosis, decreased eye movement, decreased visual acuity due to traction on the optic nerve. CT is usually performed, as we can see here. This is a vision-threatening emergency. Decompression is required with a lateral canthotomy, emergently sometimes done in the emergency department. Here we can see a lateral canthotomy being performed. The lateral canthal tendon can be thought of as forming a Y at the lateral canthus. The first step in this procedure is to make a cut so that the Y is transformed into a V. Here a utility scissors is used to open the lateral canthus approximately one centimeter. You can see that the lateral canthus now takes on the shape of a V. Next, a palfic forceps and a fine pointed scissors are used to perform the inferior cantholysis. The lateral lid margin is pulled anteriorly to place the inferior crus of the lateral canthal tendon on stretch. The scissors are turned 90 degrees to the eyelid margin and can be used to strum to the deep tissue to locate the inferior crus. Cutting this tissue releases the lid from the orbital rim. You know when you have properly completed the cut if the lateral eyelid pulls inferiorly with ease. The lower arm of the V has now been cut, completing the inferior cantholysis. Cutting the superior cruise by performing a superior cantholysis may also be necessary to adequately decrease orbital pressure. Now let's look at penetrating injury. Now in many ways, it's actually easier in the emergency department than blunt injury. And you still have to do the same structured examination of the eye as you did with the blunt injury. Very commonly, you can get a piece of dirt under the upper eyelid that by movement of the eyelid gets linear scratches on the cornea. Everting the eyelid, as we can see here, allows removal of the offending piece and the cornea itself should heal. A few days of topical antibiotics is reasonable, but nowadays we don't pad the eye. Also commonly is a foreign body into the surface of the cornea. Now, low velocity foreign bodies are easily removed with topical anesthesia to the cornea, then using a 22 gauge needle under the guidance of a slit lamp as we can see here. Now if that foreign body is in the line of vision, I would actually refer it to an ophthalmologist. Occasionally you get high velocity foreign bodies such as metal on metal, such as we can see here. These should be suspected on clinical history and look for specifically on examination. Using ultrasound can sometimes show the intraocular metallic foreign body. Obviously these are not simple corneal foreign bodies and because they've penetrated into the eye need to have an urgent ophthalmological review. Occasionally with either blunt or penetrating injuries you can get a ruptured globe. If you suspect this I wouldn't do anything more than check the visual acuity, give an analgesia, sit them up and get ophthalmological review as soon as possible, as again, this is an ocular emergency. Well, I think that'll just about do for blunt and penetrating injuries to the eye. Do look after your eyes. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Cheers.